Ever wonder what it would look like if Jigsaw booby trapped the Big Brother house? Well, wonder no more. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Daniel Liatowicz and David Todd Oakverk's weird splatter film, Colobus. Released in 1999, Colobus is basically Big Brother meets Saw. The film takes the reality TV conceit of putting a group of strangers in a house a la MTV's The Real World, and then kills them off with some Jigsaw-esque booby traps. Yeah, the mixture of these two things is every bit as strange as it sounds. And yet, Colobus has developed a cult following over the years, so much so that Arrow Video actually gave it a Blu-ray release in November of 2019. So, how does it measure up in 2020? And just how splattery is this indie film? Let's get to the gore and find out. The film opens with these credits, and this total ripoff of Goblin's Suspiria score. Man, sure hope Goblin doesn't copyright claim me for this. With Ilya Volok as faceless. Dude's name sounds like he could be a boss in Soul Calibur. And a special appearance by Linnea Quigley. Last seen on Sick Flicks in Night of the Demons. Lock up your lipstick, kids. Music by William Kidd, with a generous assist from Goblin. Over here at Bernie Wright's in School of Dark Art, everyone's hard at work on their final projects of the semester. Yeah, this looks great. You really captured the torment and suffering of your subject. A+. Plus. With the credits over, we jump to this deserted alley where Lady Macbeth is stumbling around. Out, out, damn spot. Man, this might be the most highbrow episode of Sick Flicks to date. She's about to wash off in this conveniently placed drain pipe, but look out. She gets run down instead. Someone's gonna have to spring for the deluxe package down at the car wash to get all that blood off. The driver's like, I didn't hit her, she threw herself at my car. Man, my insurance is gonna go through the roof. Then he morphs into this totally different dude. <laughs> so you gonna tell him? Um, who the hell is this guy? <sighs> Title mention, everyone drink. What was that? Second that... 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 No, it's the title of the movie, dummy. Then we jump to the OR, where these doctors clearly failed their bedside manner class. Any family notified? <laughs> no, it is only a Jane Doe. Today is Jane's lucky day. Jane's lucky day. I'm no doctor, but I think they're supposed to knock you out before they start operating. After surgery, our mystery patient has some special guests drop in for a visit. It's budget agent Dana Scully and Dr. Dre. This is sort of like how they have guys dress up as Batman and visit sick kids. Just for grown-ups. Scully gives her diagnosis, then Dre comes in to do a few bars from nothing but a G-thing. Here's my car. When you guys are ready to pick up the pace, give me a call. Oh, and we learn our mystery person is the mummy. I didn't realize Colobus was part of Universal's Dark Universe. Dre decides to bail, and Dr. Scully offers up her second diagnosis. Charming, isn't he? Well, he did have a song called Bitches Ain't Shit, so yeah, I guess we knew what he was like. Meanwhile, Melissa Rivers is over here working on her new evening at the improv routine. Meanwhile, you could pass for first runner-up in a King Tut lookalike contest. What happened to you? Tip your waiters, everyone. She's busy reading out of the classifieds, which is basically a paper version of Craigslist for you youngsters watching, when she stumbles across this entry. Wanted freeloaders. Artists seek five, five progressive-minded individuals for groundbreaking experimental film. Participants will share free lodging in a fully furnished home in the snowy Mount Olympus Resort. Oh, so this was basically just a casting call for the real world, Poughkeepsie. If you're willing to laugh, cry, love, hate, befriend, betray, and confess it all on VHS, I want you. Man, since this is a casting call for wannabe reality stars, I'm sure we're about to meet a cast of asshole characters. Fuck yeah, I'm interested! Oh shit, can I say that on TV? Case in point, must resist urge to make wiener eating joke. I'm not some kind of actress or anything like that. <laughs> you don't say. She's blabbing on, but this guy just wants his foot long. She's gonna give him a free mellow yellow to make it up to him. 
Who said customer service was dead? We then jump over here where Budget Hillary Swank is doling out some exposition. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm totally comfortable with nudity. It's just that in my transition to serious film work, I think it's important that directors look beyond my physical attributes. You know what I miss most about the late 90s? When women used a weed whacker and a ruler to do their bangs. Next up, it's this dude cosplaying Jerry Seinfeld. What's the deal with Roman Catholics? Why can't they just stay in one place? Also, nice suit. I think my mother dressed me in this exact same ensemble before taking me down to the Ola Mills studio for pictures in 1977. Oh, turns out he's one of those edgy comedians. Office parties, oh man. You know, you gotta, you gotta love it. Especially around Christmas. It only takes one line to get the secretary in a sack. <laughs> Way to read the room. Next up is this dude. He's basically the sensitive 90s academic type judging by that turtleneck sweater. You know, the guy who'd roofie your drink after you asked him to stop making you Dave Matthews band mixtapes. Even his friends think he's an annoying douche. Here's the 90s version of the photobomb. Yes, I, I appreciate car chases and explosions as much as the next guy. Also, I'm calling BS. There's no Pulp Fiction poster in this room. That was mandatory for film bros in that era. After that, it's our virginal good girl who's naive to the ways of the world. I'm Kara. Kara Mitchell. If you watch the first season of The Real World, this is basically Julie. No, they're gonna think I'm some kind of a freak. Stop the camera. Kara. I said shut it off! Well, maybe Julie with more anger management issues. Back at General Hospital, Dr. Scully offers up some more exposition. I think what we're dealing with is a troubled young woman's plea for attention. No. Mummy Chick's like, hey guys, I can hear you. I'm cut up, not deaf. And title mention again. Columbus. You know the drill. Columbus? What does it mean? Well, allow me to explain. If you two are wondering what Columbus means, it's not the name of a cool demon or anything. It's an ancient Greek word that means to maim or mutilate. The filmmakers thought it sounded cool. We then jump back to Naive Girl's place where she's hanging out with Linnea Quigley while she waits for her ride. You'll be forgiven if you don't recognize Linnea. I mean, we're not used to seeing her with clothes on. Having second thoughts? It's okay if you're not ready. Anyway, Naive Chick and Hot Dog Lady are carpooling, which is every bit as awful as you imagined it would be. I nearly shit a brick when I rolled up to your address and it turned out to be the Wacky Shack. Clearly, she has no filter. Then Kira's like, hey, you call my crib the Wacky Shack one more time and I'm gonna cut you like this. Also, if you're guessing Kira is the mummy in the hospital, well, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. Fortunately, they arrive at the Budget Overlook Hotel before things can escalate. And they meet wannabe Seinfeld, whose pickup lines are about as good as his jokes. Tom Galloway. Gangster love. Kira's ready to head in, but she spots this strange dude in the window. Look, maybe it's just Tommy Jarvis crashing another halfway house and showing off his mask collection. They're lured into the house by a scream. But you know this is just a fake out. Crazy Chick is excited about the house. Big screen TV, aquarium, I'm Yeah, this is what sort of passed for a big screen TV in the 90s. You were basically Tony Montana if you had a 35 inch Sony. Anyway, they're checking out the rooms when Hillary Swank shows up to take them on the big tour. Come on, I'll give you guys the official tour. There's even a sweet pool room. Look, I'm no Minnesota fats, but these guys seem a little stiff. Well, except this guy who scratches his way right into a jump scare. Somehow, this then turns into an impromptu episode of Club MTV. This is like a talent and melanin challenge version of Soul Train. Later that night, Kira's doing some artwork when the TV goes all poltergeist. Clearly, all they get up here is public access channels. Is this real, or is she going nuts again? Downstairs, the director has shown up and brought pizza. Looks like Tina made her own drink. The director gives his pitch, and hopefully now that we've got all this setup out of the way, we can finally get to some gore. What kind of comedian are you? Oh, I'm definitely the not even remotely funny kind. After some show and tell, where Kira freaks out over people looking at her creepy drawings, it's movie time. So what are we watching again? The Slaughterhouse Factor. Great, a movie where we watch a movie. Hope it's gorier than this one.
No, 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 these are all the same, I'm telling you. I remember this one retarded movie I saw where this guy got killed with a tennis racket. And now we're just gonna sit around, describing more awesome sounding kills from fake movies. Upstairs, Kira passes out, then the creepy dude under the bed starts lusting after her wrist scar. This sort of feels like a deleted scene from Cronenberg's Crash. Back downstairs, Tina heads off for another round of drinks and gets sliced right across the chest for her troubles. Yeah, we call that a booby trap, kids. Also, I don't think that appliance is supposed to work that way. Might be time for a safety recall. Oh wait, we're not done. The house has a taste for blood now. <laughs> Apparently, Jigsaw did the kitchen remodel in this place. You know, all reality shows love the confessional segments, but I don't think this is what they meant by go in there and spill your guts. While the gang's trying to figure out what to do, the house starts locking them in. This was a big deal in 1999. Now you just do all of this with Alexa and your phone. Technology has made life way easier for murderous psychopaths. While they're trying to get help, Tina vanishes. Oh my god. That's impossible. Nice work, Kira. You had one job. You were supposed to stay with her. We did. You didn't. You left. There's noise from the other room, so they go to investigate. It's coming from in there. And find that being a reality TV star has really gone to Tina's head. Meanwhile, Kira's losing her shit and seeing this strange faceless version of herself. <laughs> Tom's ready to get the hell out of Dodge, but he has a change of heart after almost setting off this tripwire. I said go! Don't move! <laughs> they head upstairs to look for Kira's pills, but then they hear this. Oh my god. Turns out the director has decided to get in front of the camera for a change. He liked to help these guys, but he's a little wrapped up in his own work. Man, this season of Big Brother sure got dark, didn't it? It is interesting to note that reality TV was still a relatively new phenomenon in 1999, and people really wondered how far it would go as shows kept up in the stakes for attention. While we never got the murder TV hinted at by this movie in Videodrome, we did eventually get Fear Factor and Scare Tactics after Colobus came out. So, maybe it was sort of prophetic. Anyway, back in the movie, the director is just hanging around. Was Spider-Man here? They cut him down and it's time for some exposition. It was supposed to be simple! What was? It was just a job, a stupid job. We did it for the money. If you guessed Erica as part of the reality show production, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. Just another one of her platinum performances. No, 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 I believe her. She's not that good an actress. No offense. Man, everyone's a critic. As the reality of their situation sinks in, Gary has this plan. Then we'll go up. The attic. Clearly, dude never saw Scream. Before they go, Kira sees another promo from KRAZ TV. They head upstairs to the attic, which appears empty, save for this head of one of Captain Kirk's exes. Oh, and Kira's still hallucinating. <laughs> she freaks and runs downstairs and finds the killer doing some carpentry work on Gary's face. Back upstairs, Erica and Tom find Kira's drawings. Could she be the murderous mastermind behind all of this mayhem? Back in the bathroom, Gary's not dead, he's just ready to take a nice relaxing bath to wash off all that blood. Too bad for him, it's an acid bath. Hope someone can provide some basic first aid. That's pretty bad, but the killer's not done. He's gonna perform some oral surgery with the corner of this counter. Bear with me, I didn't finish dental school. Hey, remember the hospital stuff? Yeah, it's still in this movie. Dr. Scully shows up, but Kira's still tripping. I'd like to talk to you about this, Kira. Why would you do something like this to yourself? Weird. She wakes up back in the house, and Tom and Erica are convinced she's the killer. I didn't! But spare us the wide-eyed innocent routine. You killed him. 
They lock her in the bathroom and decide to take a field trip to the basement. Because, sure, what could go wrong? Too bad the way is blocked by all these laser tripwires like it's a Mission Impossible movie. After some more jibber-jabber, they decide to make a break for it. Except Tom wimps out. Go! Tom! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just... Nice work, Tom. Back in the bathroom, Kira is getting visited by her faceless twin. She's ready to confront her once and for all, but of course, nothing's there. There's nothing wrong with me! There's nothing wrong with me! Gonna be hell to get all that blood out of the grout, though. Back at the basement door, Tom's vanished. Just like his comedy career. Erica arms herself and sets off to find him. Don't know what good a knife is gonna do against booby traps, but have at it, I guess. <laughs> Told ya. She's like that Elvis song, caught in a trap, but manages to barricade herself in the library. <laughs> too bad the killer's in here, too. He grabs her and says, let me show you a killer rack, then impales her head on these antlers. This feels like a nod to Fulci Zombie, where Olga Carlatos gets a splinter driven into her eye. Given the filmmaker's love of Italian cinema, this is probably not a coincidence. And yeah, we're gonna get the zombie one of these days. Kira's free again, and she finds Tom taking a snooze. Are you okay? Where the hell did you just come from? They're the last two people alive on this really weird episode of Survivor, and they're gonna head to the basement. Sure hope Dr. Freudstein isn't down here. Kira finds a window, and a jump scare. But Tom's gone again. Tom! Tom, answer me! This dude disappears more often than a magician's assistant. She doesn't need him though, she just slides this conveniently placed bench over. Aw oh, man, who let their dog shit on this thing? I'll never get this off my shoes. Turns out it's worse. It's another severed head. She dips out but runs right into this slasher film standard, the killer's diorama. Really, how do killers manage to find time to stage all of these bodies? Then the TV comes back on and we get to watch this dude peel cold cuts off his face. She's ready to flee again, but dead Tom is in the way. Then she backs right into this jump scare. Dude's like, stop struggling, I did all this so you can have your first professional art exhibit. Show some gratitude. So, it turns out this is all basically about art imitating life. Or death. I don't know, work with me here. Then he decides to make her shave. But surprise, she turns the table and slashes his throat. He's not dead though, so she's like, nine ball, corner pocket of your face. And then she impales his head on a pool cue. <laughs> then we cut back to the hospital. Because sure, why not? Kira's getting released, but not before we get our prescription of exposition filled. The word actually comes from an ancient Greek term, which when distilled into 90s lingo, basically means mutilated. Hey, thanks, Scully, but I already explained this. Stay in your lane. Anyway, she takes off and heads back home, but she's not alone. Kira, touch me. Touch me now. <sighs> Someone's begging her to touch them, and if you guessed it was our straight razor, well, nice work. And also, what's wrong with you? The razor wants her to do one more thing. There is something I want you to do. And the cycle begins anew. Wanted. Freeloaders. Artist seeks five progressive-minded individuals. I first saw Colobus back when it hit video, and I really hated it. Revisiting it two decades later, I don't dislike it nearly as much as I did back in the day, but I'm also still surprised it's garnered its cult reputation. The film is more interesting now as a sort of time capsule back to the late 90s and the early days of reality television, but I still think 2002's My Little Eye covers the same ground in a more interesting and effective manner. But hey, that movie didn't have this groovy R&B slow jam over the end credits. Face to face let Seriously, what the hell is that? Colobus doesn't always work, but it does have quite a few kills. Will that be enough to earn it five barf bags? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, Colobus delivers some solid splatter. We're treated to multiple beheadings, one acid bath, several self-mutilations, an evisceration, a pool cue through the head, and that brutal head on the antler scene. 
It takes a while to get to the gore, but when we finally arrive, it's pretty solid. And because of that, I'm giving Colobus three barf bags out of five. This is a moderately sick flick. Looking for another weird slasher flick with a disfigured character skulking about? Then check out my review of Bloody Moon. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.